Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Lord's house on this, the second Sunday after Epiphany. A Sunday when the church historically focuses on Jesus' first miracle or sign, according to the Gospel of John, uh, where he's at a wedding feast and where he turns simple water into the very, very, very best of wine. That will provide much of our focus for our sermon message today. The service, as usual, is outlined on our little folder. Uh, we'll basically be following Divine Service 3, but not a lot of some liturgy. Uh, and we'll begin our service this morning with hymn number 395, O Morning Star, How Fair and Bright. 395, we'll be singing verses 1 through 3. O 
Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. All the earth shall worship thee, and shall sing unto thee, O God. They shall sing to thy name, O thou most high. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name, and make his praise glorious. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Yahweh, 
And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my faith, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand, on a rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. This is 
the gospel of the Lord. Some water is 
Well, it is summoned by its master. It is drawn by servants as directed by Jesus. And we sometimes say it blushes. It turns from water to wine. And so we have the first of, of seven of the miracles or, or signs, as John calls them. And in it, we are told that Jesus manifested his glory. And so it becomes a fitting epiphany text. For this man is God. He can do things that only God can do. He can live in a way that only God can do. Now, he is fully human. Been around now in the world when this story happens for some 30 years or so. But in addition to being that man, he is also God. Now, it's not that hard to pick out the miracle in this probably familiar story. And maybe it's not even that hard to see what it tells us, what it shows us about this character, this Jesus. But the bride and groom and their family had, had, just, had just messed up. And to run out of wine at a wedding feast would have been a major social faux pas. And in the midst of that uncertainty and worry, there's Jesus. And John tells the story in a very simple way, but he does it in a way that if you'll allow yourself a little time, and if you'll turn your mind loose just a little bit, I think John will invite us to see, or at least be mindful of so much more than the obvious, miracle itself. You see, John wrote his gospel after the gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke had already been written and were already accepted in the church. So he doesn't need to retell the story once again as they had done. And so John is free to, to fill in some of the other details or to write his gospel in a way that helps us recall and think about maybe even more than we first see when we encounter the story. I mean, come on. On the third day? And where does your mind go? If it's like mine, it goes to Good Friday. And to Easter. Behind this simple miracle story looms Easter and the resurrection. Uh, there's a setting of the wedding feast, and later Jesus will use a wedding feast as the backdrop for much of his teaching and for some of, some of his best-known parables. Mary and the other disciples are there. But you know something interesting? In John's Gospel, this will be the last time we hear of Mary. The first and last time we will hear of Mary until we find her and at least one of the disciples standing at the foot of the cross. Even as he tells the story, John would have us remember where Jesus was going. There are obviously the people in need, the people at the feast, the bride and groom. And we have Jesus speaking of his hour and how his hour has not come. He will repeat this later in John's Gospel. And then, during Holy Week, as his betrayal and arrest draws near, Jesus will declare, My hour has come. And then, of course, there's wine. Well, water to start with. And then wine. And not just any old wine. Not just wine suitable 
for addressing the problem. But the best wine, a wine so much better that the steward or the host had to go ask the groom, what's going on? Why have you saved this stuff for the end? Now, our minds might track to a, a whole host of different stories from Scripture. Uh, references to the six stone jars. Um, we might begin to think of, of a six-day creation in the beginning. Or we might think of all of the Old Testament purification rituals and requirements. That, that old stuff that had gotten pe God's people this far by continuously looking ahead to the Messiah, to the long-promised Savior. And John, Jesus, had begun to announce he was here. And so now, Jesus is standing there amongst or near these, these stone jars used for ritual purification. And uh, he stands there surrounded by his disciples and other wedding guests who are sinners. Even though they may have been washed with this water in an act of purification, they were sinners. And the water would not atone for their sin. I'm sure the people back there gossiped. I'm sure they grumbled and complained about taxes and about the government and about their neighbor and about the no good so and so in their family or down the street or in the church. I'm sure they worried more about themselves than about others. And I suspect they didn't always keep God as the number one thing in their life. They didn't fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And neither do we. But those stone jars, the water for purification, all that old stuff, good, helpful, perhaps even the best that man could do for a time, some things that God had given them to point them forward to a better, Washing to come. That water was, was to remind them that they needed to be cleansed. They needed to be washed. Their sin needed to be atoned for. But God's law and obedience to God's law, even our very best efforts, would never be enough. The law was never given to save. Because God is holy. And we're not. We're not even close left to ourselves. And so, along comes Jesus. Along comes Jesus with the good stuff with the very best stuff, with healing and forgiveness, with light and life and love. For He is holy. The people around Him and us were and are not. But He was. Ah, that, my friends, is the best stuff. That is sweet wine. Even in the midst of our lives, 
which may seem all messed up and all uncertain. In our lives where we're hurting over the loss of loved ones, whether we're hurting about strange relationships or if we're carrying around guilt or shame, in the midst of all that stands the good stuff. Jesus himself, the very best, and saved, if you will, for the end. The old stuff, fine, got us through. But now the best arrives on the scene. Now, I suspect that this is not the way that you or I may have handled things. It certainly wasn't the way that Jews in Jesus' day would have handled things. They would have started with the very best and, and then bring the other out later on. But uh, that's not how God does things. And it shouldn't surprise us that God would do things a little bit differently. You see, God, who had given his law hundreds of years earlier at Mount Sinai, well, that law is good. Make no mistake about it. It is helpful. It is correct. But God had given that to Moses and his Old Testament people at Sinai. And now he was giving his people something even better, even sweeter, his son, our Savior. You see, Jesus is the good stuff. He is the best that God offers. Jesus and all that he did and all that he said, all that he gave, all that he shed, all that he suffered, that is the best stuff. Jesus and all that he means for sinful mankind is sweet, incredibly sweet. Not commonly appreciated by just anyone, but to those who have been blessed with a gift of spirit-created faith, something more precious than anything else on the planet. Jesus and all that he makes possible for sinful man. And, and his gifts, they too are so sweet. Everything that he has won for us, it's actually all way too big for us to even begin to wrap our minds around. They're so big that we need the Holy Spirit to grant us eyes and hearts of faith, to see it, to taste its sweetness, and to cling to it for all that it's worth. And so, a splash of water and some words spoken over a child or an adult, and that child is brought on board the Ark of the Church. He or she is made a child of God with promises of salvation and eternal life. Words spoken by another sinful man in the stead by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ become incredibly sweet words if we will but use our hands of faith to receive and believe them. Your sins have been forgiven. Jesus said so this morning again, using my lips, using my voice, but it's Jesus nevertheless. And a little morsel of some pretty plain ordinary bread and a, and a sip of rather ordinary wine and we receive with it forgiveness, life, and salvation. It's his way. And that, my friends, is the good stuff. 
And the Spirit has given us, well, if you'll allow, He's given us tongues of faith to taste the sweetness of God's incredible gifts. So drink. Drink, people loved by God. Drink deeply of His love, of His goodness, of His grace and mercy. Your cup overflows. Drink. It's the good stuff sent by God the Father, delivered to you in the person and work of Jesus, His Son, and delivered to you by the Holy Spirit. Savor. Savor. Think about, ponder the forgiveness, the total and complete forgiveness He has given you. The bitterness of our messed up lives and our sin and doubt and worry turned into the sweet peace of His righteousness. Drink in His Word. Drink it in deeply. His water into wine changing Word. His sin forgiving, life restoring Word. His bread and wine into body and blood changing word. Drink it all in. The words of forgiveness and life and peace in Christ. It's always intrigued me in this story how Christ's ministry when it's not his hour begins with water being turned to wine. <laughs> And then when his hour arrives, it will be simple wine that he turns into his blood. Hidden in this familiar story, in this wonderful and marvelous miracle, is Good Friday, and Easter, and the Holy Supper, and Holy Baptism, and Holy Absolution. It's a complex flavor palette. So drink it in deeply, people loved by God, and know that God loves you, and He has in mind for you only the best, and so He sends the best. His Son, Jesus Christ, your Savior and mine. He is the good stuff. Amen. We stand for prayer. This morning, as we lift our prayers and petitions before God's throne of grace, we want to remember especially the family and friends of Becky Wiesman who entered her final rest uh, last evening. Uh, she spent a couple of days in the hospital over in Alton and then was able to come back home and she passed away there surrounded by family and friends last night. We pray. Oh Christ, at Cana, you manifested your divine glory with your first miraculous sign. By faithfulness to your word, make this congregation and all your church a light that shines your love and forgiveness into our sin-darkened world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At Cana, you pointed to the glory to be revealed when you would be crucified and raised to win salvation for all. Open our hearts and the hearts of fellow sinners everywhere to your gifts in the word and sacrament, that we may receive and hold fast the gift of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At Cana, 
Mary directed the servants to do whatever he said. Bless the pastors and teachers, missionaries and servants of your church to follow your word in all things for the salvation of your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. At Cana, you provided in abundance what was lacking. We thank you for the countless gifts you have given us, including food, and clothing, shelter, and the many benefits we enjoy and often take for granted here in this country. Bless the efforts of our rulers to maintain peace and promote justice, and watch over and direct all our military personnel, including chaplains, that they may be sustained in times of trial. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. O Lord, forgive our nation for the sin of abortion. Countless millions of the most defenseless little babies have been sacrificed on the altar of convenience or preference or choice. Forgive us and grant us repentant hearts with courage to turn from the evil way of death to instead embrace your ways of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Christ, at Canaan, you bless the husband and wife by your presence. Visit our homes with your forgiveness, peace, and joy. Turn husbands and wives toward each other that they may live together in peace and joy. Bless our families, that parents may serve as examples of righteousness, and children may joyfully live under their care, showing obedience and respect. According to your will, give pious spouses to those who wish to be married, and grant solid friendships to those who are single. In all things, keep us free from every sexual sin. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. At Cana, you showed divine compassion, even for our simple earthly needs. Enable us to pray for all people and for their needs. Grant us compassionate hearts for those who are lacking in the bodily, bodily necessities of this life, that we may show mercy to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, grant steadfast faith to us and to all who are suffering, who are ill, injured, or undergoing medical tests or treatment, and all who mourn. Heed and answer their cries according to your loving kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, we give thanks for the gift of new life given to Carrie and Daniel Carnes. Keep mother and child safe until the appointed time for the child's arrival, and grant that by water and the word the child might be brought on board the ark of Christ's church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Christ, at Cana you provided good wine for the wedding banquet. In these days you provide us the best wine, your precious blood, at your holy table. Preserve all those who participate this day in this foretaste of the eternal wedding feast to come so that they may, may again receive you in repentance and faith and with you the benefits you won for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your goodness and mercy. For you reign with the Father and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Be part in peace and joy. Amen. We stand. <clears throat> oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good.
Becky Wiesman passed away, I believe, later uh, yesterday evening. So no words on plans or anything like that. And given the conditions, who knows what those might be. Um, but it was, uh, I was able to see her in the hospital. Uh, we were able to do our, our final little service together. And uh, what joy it brings to a pastor's heart um, when, when the person that we're, we're focused on is, is praying right along with you. The 23rd Psalm, the Creed, the Our Father. It was a glorious way uh, to give her a farewell and to commit her into the hands of a, a loving Heavenly Father. Uh, just a reminder, there is a council meeting scheduled for tomorrow night here at the church at 7 o'clock, so all council members, uh, please plan on attending that. And then on Wednesday evening at 7, we'll continue with uh, our midweek study. We're taking a, a quick look at some of the Psalms, and I'm going to endeavor to try to give the people tools uh, for better reading or praying those Psalms so we can begin to to mind some of the incredible gifts that are contained in this Psalter. Are there other announcements that we should make everyone aware of this morning? If not, then God's blessings to all of you.